Hey everyone, this is Christopher Luxon, the former CEO of Air New Zealand. This is John Lee Dumas, the founder and host of Entrepreneurs on Fire. This is Tracy Ibarra. I'm an executive solutions at Dell Technologies. This is Travis Chappell, founder of Build Your Network. If you are wanting to learn how to embrace change and to navigate through disruption as a leader, then listen to the Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast. The Leadership is Changing podcast with my good friend, my very good friend, Dennis Giannoutsos. Welcome to Leadership is Changing. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change. This is taking your leadership to another level by finding the balance between executive excellence and personal well-being through stories that inspire real change. It's time to adapt in our fast-moving world when leadership is changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsos. Hey there, listeners. Welcome to the Leadership is Changing podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Giannoutsos, and I want to welcome you to the Highlights 2023 episode that I want to share here with you. What I'm doing is I'm actually going back to a few of the highlight interviews that I've had throughout 2023 and pulling them together, what we call a mashup, and we bring them all together so you can listen to some of them, have a taste of some of them, and then allowing you then to go back and listen to the full episode. So, I have three guests on this one. 428 is the episode number, Matt McWilliams, and that was around focus on the leadership principles. He's a best-selling author of a book called Turn Your Passions Into Profits. He's known as The Affiliate Guy. From episode 431, Dawn Abbott, uh, leadership is not an entitlement, it's an obligation. And that's something that leaders really need to think about a lot. And Dawn is an entrepreneur she had a traumatic incident happen with because she owned the business with her husband and it forced Dawn to take time out to evaluate about things and about life and about business as well. And episode 440, John Becker, creating a culture of servant leadership. Now, John, if you think about the tactical force teams, things like SWAT and SEAL teams and things like that, here's a business whereby he's the founder and CEO of Advark. Tactical, so it provides a whole lot of tools and gear that they need to have when they're out there in the field. Fantastic. Three people, great interviews. So sit back and enjoy the highlights. Now, I've got a guest with me who I've been wanting to have on the show for a while, and uh, he's a cool guy, and uh, he is a guy who's known as the affiliate guy, and his name is Matt McWilliams. Matt, a massive welcome to you. Hey, Dennis. Thanks so much for having me. Excellent. Hey, look, first of all, congratulations to you on your book that you've just released and how it's gone for you. So it's a really, really cool book, listeners. It's called Turn Your Passions Into Profit. So Matt, well done on that. That's that's really cool to see. Yeah, that was fun. It's, uh, it's a dream eight years in the making. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really, I think the most exciting part is that it's, it's, in, it's in bookstores, you know, and, and less than one 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 hundredth of one percent of books ever make it in the bookstores, which is kind of crazy. I love that it's there. I love that it's in libraries. You know, this book, you know, newsflash people, you don't make that much money on books. So for me, it's all about impact, you know, with the book. And so, I mean, there was a time in my life, you know, 17 years ago where libraries made all the difference for me. The greats like Zig Ziglar and Les Brown, Tony Robbins, Brian Tracy, Jeffrey Gittimer, all those people that I learned so much of what I still use today. I learned from reading books in the library. You know, there was a time in my life where spending 15, 20 bucks on a book was, was a, that was a difficult decision, you know? So to be able to read five, six books a month from the local library was a, was a blessing to me and, and still has lasting effects. So even like getting it in, you know, most of the libraries around the world has been a, been a big, big deal to me. So yeah, thank you. It's, it's been, been pretty cool. Excellent. Now you mentioned just something there, which is about, you know, not making a lot of money in books and, and, but it's more about visibility and so forth. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute around branding, what it means for a leader and their branding yep. and so forth. So we'll come back to that. Now, whereabouts in the, in the world are you today? Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we're known for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, we were joking about, I had a uh, team meeting earlier and we were joking about how, you know, I said, yeah, the, somebody had moved, one of our clients had moved from Texas to New Hampshire. And I said, yeah, the only thing that could ever make a man do that is his wife's family. You know, and I, I was like, because that's why I moved north. And I have quite a few people, friends that, you know, I grew up in the south. I grew up in the nice warm weather mostly. And we moved up here because we, we wanted to pick at least one family to be closer to. And, you know, we ended up 
kind of in a coin flip picking my wife's family. So now it's one of those things you can never leave because her, you know, all their closest friends and, and all, you know, kids' closest friends and our soccer and everything is here. So we'll never leave. But yeah, I'm in Fort Wayne, which it's a, you know, it's one of those things like the thing I love about this place. I'm a city boy. I have to be five minutes from everything, but you can be five minutes, like our property, you were five, seven minutes from anything you could ever want. Major restaurants, stores, everything. If I plopped you in our backyard in the middle of summer when the trees are in bloom, you'd think you're out in the country. You know, mm. so I love it here. You can get across town in 15 minutes and yet we have everything, you know, about 300,000 people, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's so spread out that it doesn't feel like a clustered city. So it's the perfect city, it turns out, for me to live in. That almost sounds like the city that I grew up here in New Zealand in Wellington. It's the, out, the, the greater Wellington is about $375,000 people, but um, I've got money on my brain at the moment with profits in the book, <laughs> right? And the thing is, is you're right, it's so cool to just be able to do that. Now I live in a city, it's around about 1.7 million. There it is again, people. <laughs> And it's amazing. It takes longer, longer to get around the place, which is interesting. Yep. Now, tell us more about your background, where you've come from, what you've done, because I know you also, you've had people that you've actually helped as well. Some big names like the Shark Tanks, uh, Kevin Harrington, Tony Robbins, Dean Graziosi, just to name yep. a few, Jeff Walker. And that's actually how I, I got to know you actually through the Jeff Walker side of things. So tell us more about your background, what you've done and that, because the listeners love to hear that. Yeah, it is crazy to think where we're at now. I mean, the people that, that I've been able to work with, you know, people that I've I looked up to for you know, almost two decades in some cases. Yeah, I've worked with Zig Ziglar's company. You know, Zig had already passed away, but I mean, I know his son and I know his, you know, his business and I've worked with them. I've worked with Tony Robbins' company and Dean Graziosi's launch, helping them. Jeff Walker, like you mentioned, Brian Tracy, you know, Michael Hyatt. Like these are people that I, I wouldn't say I idol. I don't, I don't idolize anybody personally. That's just a I'm not like that, but people that I got so much value from, that people that impacted my life in such great ways, and I always looked up to them. And then we've worked with them. Like I've, I've worked with these people. It's, it's, it's amazing, you know. Like these few people, I can I can text and they'll endorse the book, you know, and and things like that. And that came about through kind of a weird long stretch of circumstances, you know. You know, to to, to go back to the book, the original first words in the book were from the, the Grateful Dead song, Truckin'. It says, what a long, strange trip it's been. And uh, we had to delete those because it turns out with song lyrics, you have to get permission from the publisher of the song, and that's a pain in the butt. And we just decided to change the, the opening quote. But that's a pretty apt description of my life. You know, what a long, strange trip it's been because I got into leadership. I got into, you know, business sort of by accident. About 20 some odd years ago, 22 years ago now, I started my first website company and I started, I was teaching golf schools with my dad and my dad thankfully fired me because I was terrible at golf instruction, but that was what led to me getting into this online business world. You know, for me, the the head of that was like, you know, we were teaching these golf schools and on the weekends, I'd do the Friday, Saturday, Sunday golf school, about 20 hours of golf school over the course of three days. People would pay about $2,000 a person to come. And we had like four people come into these golf schools. It's, you know, at the age of 22, 20 hours for, you know, for $4,000, because we make about $8,000 split it two ways. Tw you know, 20 hours for $4,000 is amazing at the age of 22. I was like, dad, what if we had 10 people? Could we handle 10 people? He's like, yeah, we can handle 10 people in one of these golf schools. So I got on Google, you know, this brand new website. I was like, dad, there's this website called Google. You know, he's like, what? What's a Google? I'm like, I don't know, but it's like a search engine or something, you know, and you give them money and then they send you traffic. And, and you know, we teach in the book and, and what people are accustomed to today is, you know, today you, you come to the website, you opt in, you, you create a lead magnet. That's what step four is all about. You create a lead magnet, they subscribe, you nurture the relationship, and then you sell something, right? But at that time, that we didn't know that. You came to my website, you either gave me $2,000 or you left, but about one out of every 200 people would give me $2,000. It cost us 10 cents a click. You do the math. $20 to acquire a $2,000 customer. Now, that's not replicatable today, just to be, to be clear. But at that time, we were getting four, five people every week mm. signing up for these golf schools, in addition to the three to five that we already had, we were doing, we were having eight to 10 people coming. There were weekends, Dennis, I would leave the weekend with $20,000, all right? There were weekends, because we'd do two of these golf schools, right? We had a morning and an afternoon session. I'd work 40 hours in a weekend. Don't misunderstand me. It was a long weekend, but I would make 20 grand. That's insane at the age of mm. 22 to make $20,000 mm. in three days of work. 
but it taught me what online business was. And so I was like, okay, I'm all in. My dad fired me because I sucked at golf instruction, but I loved the, you know, the marketing and the business side. So I started another company and, um, you know, we were kind of in desperate straits one day. It was Memorial Day in, in the U.S., a weekend, 2005. In the U.S., I was supposed to be at a barbecue. I'm supposed to be sitting by a pool. I'm supposed to be hanging out with my friends. I didn't do any of that. I spent the entire weekend trying to figure out how to set up an affiliate program because we needed some way to bring in revenue without paying out revenue in the short term. We didn't have any more money. We we're going to go bankrupt. We couldn't make payroll. And so I built this affiliate program from scratch. About 18 months later, we're doing over a million dollars a month. And we could talk about that whole process if we want. But like the point was, I learned some stuff along the way and I, I learned how to do online marketing. I learned how to do online business and how to you know build systems and all those things. And so today, what we do is we teach a lot of people how to do that. We teach people how to build affiliate programs, how to do affiliate marketing, how to monetize. You know, this the book's all about you know creating a, a website around your passions and your message and your you know the things that you're interested in and monetizing that. That's why it's called passions into profits, not just how to turn your passions into a hobby or a hobby blog or a podcast. No, it's profits. And so that's today. That's what we help people do, and uh, it's been a journey. But ultimately, it led, like you said, to kind of us being able to work with some pretty pretty amazing people along the way. That's a fascinating background and story. If there was one thing that you could pull out of that as a, probably being one of the massive insights or lessons for you along that journey, would there be anything that sort of stands out for you? I mean, the thing that, the kind of the theme that stands out in my life and in my business is the word iteration. I use that word a lot. We were having a team meeting earlier and we were talking about a specific process in our company. I said, guys, right now we do not have a process. We don't need a process. There's a specific team member that all this work goes through right now. I said, most days he's able to get the work done in eight hours and he's not overwhelmed. And when he is overwhelmed, he will come to me and tell me he's overwhelmed and we'll figure it out from there. But we don't need a process for this. I said, right now we're going to just do it a certain way and we'll, we'll iterate. We'll iterate this process over time as we need it. It's, it's moving fast and breaking things, you know, to quote Facebook. It's, it's just getting stuff out there and, see, you know, possibly screwing some stuff up along the way. That's part of that process. You're going to, you're going to screw some stuff up. You know, you're going to make some mistakes, but we're going to iterate. So we're going to get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. And we're not seeking perfection because perfectionism is, you know, is really just an excuse not to take action. And yeah. so if you look at my life and the way my business career, it's been iteration after iteration after iteration, but it's been taking action fast making those small mistakes fast. is like starting a website. You know, try things when you only have 140 subscribers. Why? Because you only have 140 people who give a crap. Make mistakes. Every time you start adding zeros, oh, you get 1,400, you start getting a little bit more cautious. 14,000? You're nervous about making mistakes. When you have over 100,000 people who follow you, who are subscribed to your email list, you barely will try anything. So try everything when you have 140 people. You know, try everything when you have 500 people. Make some mistakes. Don't try to get everything systematized immediately, but then do systematize over time. And so you'll like, if you observe the way we do business, like we have almost two extremes in the early stages. It's like, there's no system. It's willy nilly throw crap against the wall and see what sticks in the latter stages. It becomes very systematized. It becomes very McDonald's like, mm. you know, like here's exactly how you do this and the system you follow. And here's the process. But sometimes that takes a year, year and a half before we reach that point. Sure. So I'm sort of an entrepreneur at heart and started my first business when I was 21 years old with my husband. And I still own that business. I just no longer handle any of the day-to-day -day operation and ended up through the journey starting two more businesses because that's oftentimes what, what entrepreneurs do, right? See shiny things and <laughs> start, start new lines of revenue and things like that. Yep. And, you know, ran the rat race, it ran the treadmill, so to speak, and made all the entrepreneurial mistakes you can make and worked too hard, sacrificed a lot of life and things like that. And then if you fast forward to 2013, we had two sons who were 18 and 21. And so and three businesses and sort of looking at the next phase of this, you know, we we're going to be empty nesters and things like that. And then I found out that I was pregnant which was, you know, not necessarily the the plan at that point. <laughs> so through some soul searching, realized there must be a, you know, a reason for this great accidental blessing. And so she was born in May 2013, just before our, our then youngest, now middle, graduated from high school. 
four days. And then in August of that year, I lost my husband and business partner in an accident. And so I had this three month old baby and these two young men who lost their dad and these three businesses without a partner in any of that. And I share that because what happened after that, you know, trauma was sort of a forced letting go of the vine and a forced mindset change that I think leaders, it's important for them to have and hopefully they can have it without trauma, right? And, and what happened is the team picked up the ball and they ran with it and the businesses kept going, even though I did not have the bandwidth at that time to really care a whole lot about them. And what it did is sort of show me that if I delegated and let my team do their job and empowered them to do that, I didn't have to be in the way so much. Right? I didn't have to be doing everything. And so I was really given a bunch of of the gift of freedom of time because the team was working hard and they didn't need me and things were going well. And I got to sort of dig into who I was and what I wanted the rest of my life to look like because it wasn't going to look like what I had planned. And and that's when I did a lot of soul searching and realized what I loved about the business is building culture and building the team and the systems and processes. And then when my oldest son came to me a few years later after he had graduated and things like that and said that he wanted to take over the business and buy it someday. That's when we implemented EOS in my business and saw just amazing changes, both financially and culturally. And I was kind of put into the owner's box and no longer had any tasks and, and decided that that's what I wanted to do next with the rest of my life is help other business owners walk through that same sort of transformation of, of understanding their vision, who they were, where they were going how they were going to get there, create some systems and a, and a cohesive, healthy team. And so that's what I get the pleasure of doing now. And still, you know, like I said, on those businesses and watching my son take them over and, and grow and learn and get his knocks, <laughs> all those kinds of things. So, yeah. Wow. No. So I've got a few questions to ask because it's, uh, thank you for sharing that because it's, it's what a journey. Amazing. Yeah. And, and the thing here I wanted to ask you is, you know, when you, I mean, firstly, one thing you just said there before about your son wanting to buy the business is like, wow, mm -hmm. that's a bit different yeah. because sometimes they want to take the business rather than yeah. inherit the business, <laughs> right? Rather than buying the business. So that's different. The, the question I've got for you is in the midst of when it was all happening, husband, you know, the three month year old, two young boys, you've got also your, your husband's passed away, things like that. You've got these yeah. businesses. Did you, you talked about delegating, which is, which is important mm -hmm. for, for a lot of leaders and a lot of people to understand delegation. The thing I got the question is, did you delegate straight away or did you have to delegate because of the circumstances you're at or did Dawn try to do everything herself as well? I say, you know, I would say prior to the accident and things like that, I certainly tried to delegate and I obviously had a team. But I think we get stuck as leaders in this place of control and ego and, and fear of, oh my gosh, if we let them do it, you know, it's going to fall apart. So there was some delegation prior. And I think the true letting go was because just mentally, I wasn't capable of doing a whole lot, right? In the acute grief. And having a three-month-old, so you're also postpartum and all kinds of crazy things. Um, mm. I, I just, you know, I just didn't care really about the business at that point. It, it stopped being all-encompassing, like it had been my whole life or the, the whole time I was running the business. Right? It's all you think about, and it, and it and it is your life. And it really became, oh, this is just part of my life. And so that delegation to sort of answer your question was, I think, just. It, it was nothing I did. It was simply the circumstances. And then once I realized things were going just as well, maybe better without me having to make all the decisions because I was creating a bunch of clogs, right? A bunch of obstacles to things getting done oftentimes when everything had to go through. So that's when the sort of mindset shift of, oh, this is good. <laughs> this is better that I, that I stand in their way and I just, and I just show up when they, you know, providing a space for them to need me when they need me, rather yeah. than telling them they have to need me. So I started my business when I was 17 doing rock climbing equipment. 
and right away started to deal with military units and special operations groups who were buying ropes and harnesses and carabiners. And kind of my, my mantra was I didn't want to be a sales guy. I wanted to understand the product and be of value to my consumer and kind of add value. And I didn't really understand it in those terms at that point, but that's kind of what I wanted to do. So I spent a great deal of time studying and learning about the product and was fortunate enough that the first real clients I had in law enforcement and military were kind of the founders of, of SWAT as a concept in the United States. And, and it's, I always say that I learned to hit from Babe Ruth and I learned to dance from Fred Astaire. And so I was, I was brought up by those guys. At, at my 20s, I went to law school. I spent two years working in LAPD's police litigation unit, worked on Rodney King, Reginald Denny, a bunch of the big you know, law enforcement cases. And the business just went in that direction. And so, you know, now 55, you know, 38 years later, we do primarily law enforcement and military equipment, mostly protective equipment, and really geared towards tactical operators. So people that would do tactical intervention, whether it's, you know, Navy SEALs or LAPD SWAT or Australian Defense Forces type of, of operators. Oh, wow. Oh, that's fascinating. Oh, we're going to really look forward to this conversation. It's going to be really good. We're going to get into some areas as well. Now, I also understand that you've done some Ironman triathlons into racing sports cars. You do some speaking on tech, with technical organizations across the, um, across the U.S. Anything else you like doing? Yeah, no, I, I like sports that take me to uncomfortable places. I learned early on, both as a leader and a human being, that the more time I spend pushing my own boundaries, whether that's putting myself in situations where I'm scared, putting myself in situations where I don't know what I'm doing, or in the case of racing, putting myself in situations where I'm, I'm overwhelmed and, and have to learn an entirely new discipline, that is really where I grow and how I develop. And so that's kind of everything that I do for fun is geared towards pushing my own limits. Mm. Mm. You know, when you say that, because I think it's really interesting that I think in leadership today, whatever the field or industry is, are we pushing ourselves enough today as leaders? Are we taking it to the boundaries, the limits? What are we doing? I mean, we are facing times, or we face things at times, which are the unknown, right? The ambiguity. We're not sure. What, we don't even know what we're doing sometimes. Do you think leaders are actually pushing themselves enough? No, absolutely not. And COVID certainly hurt this, right? COVID, COVID kind of sent us all back to our caves to, to, to kind of wall ourselves off and be afraid that the, the plague was going to get us. But I think it triggered a lot of primitive thoughts for a lot of people. And I think we kind of, for lack of a better term, you know, if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs, I think COVID pushed us all back down the triangle. And I think the result is that a lot of leaders have become managers. They've become reactionary. And they've, you know, we, we've been dealing with so many difficult situations and so much change over the last few years that it's become very easy to avoid development and to avoid true leadership. So no, I don't think we are. Not even close. Yeah. Okay. So I, I agree with you totally. I think they are avoiding things as well. What can we do with leaders today to sort of say to them, hey, you need to wake up, you need to step up, you need to not avoid things. Let's, do you, any ideas on what you think should actually happen here to help them? I think, I think the first thing is that every leader should, you know, if, if you lead a group of two people, one of your primary objectives should be developing yourself, mm. should be focusing on making you as good at your job as you can possibly be and, and, and you know, helping you to understand what it is to lead other people and, and what it is to care about culture and how to set a culture and lead a culture. And I think that one of the things that I've learned in, in dealing with so many military units and so many special operations groups and just amazing leaders is the really effective units, the really elite units are elite because they are brilliant at fundamentals. They spend a great deal of time focusing on all of the little things and the execution of the little things. And it's, it's interesting. I, I just recently interviewed a guy named Master Sergeant Earl Plumley, who's a Congressional Medal of Honor winner for Afghanistan, who, if, if you listen to the episode, the story will literally just make you light your man card on fire. It's, it's, it is a ridiculous story. You wouldn't believe it if it was a movie. One of the things Earl said when I talked to him was, what enabled him to perform at such a high level was that all of the little things, marksmanship, reloading, movement, tactical awareness, they had drilled into him so many times that he didn't think about them anymore. And I think as leaders, we need to understand the basics of leading people and the basics of what those who work for us do 
at a very deep level so we can focus on the higher aspect things. Mm. And I think there's, there's, a, there's a few things that you're sharing there. The basics is really important. And I think some people try to make it too fancy. No, let's go back to the basics. Keep it simple, one. Two is drill it, keep going, keep practicing, keep doing what you need to do, because then it becomes second nature. Third thing would be is that eye for detail. And it's what you're saying is about the execution of it, that it's, it's focusing on it so good, so well, that it does become elite. And I think that it's mastering, becoming the master of what you do is really important. Well, I think as leaders, it's also easy, especially as young leaders, it's easy to think that your job is to manage people. I would say, you know, systems are managed, right? Quality is managed. Air conditioning systems are managed. People are led. Hmm. And as a leader, your job is to develop the people who work for you to get as much out of them as you can. Right. I always say that, that each person has a hundred percent potential. And some of those have a hundred percent potential that's a hundred percent. And some of them have a hundred percent potential that's seventy percent. Your job is to get the full seventy percent. It's to get the full hundred percent. And the only way that happens is if you are focused on developing them and caring for them and providing an environment where they can flourish. You know, it's it's too often people look at it as like, oh, you know, my job is to hit them with a stick when they get out of line. Yeah. No, your job is to make sure they don't get out of line. Your job is, is to create an environment for them where they thrive and are happy and are, and are enjoying their job and can be passionate about what they're doing so that they never have to get out of line. And, and it's, you know, that's one of the differences for me between management and leadership, right? Management is constantly hitting people with a stick. Leadership is never needing to use the stick. Yeah, I agree. And I think the thing is, it's about, it's about you setting them up for success straight away. And oh, it's, I, love, I love what you just said there, create an environment where they thrive. I think that's, that's spot on. Now, you mentioned a couple of times just before about, you know, and you've got this episode and so forth. So you've got a your podcast yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. It's called The Debrief. Mm. And it's focused on tactical topics. I interview law enforcement, military leaders, influential people, people that kind of created the market or people that have been through you know, harrowing events, you know, it's really focused on a tactical audience that we have, we have a crossover business audience that listens to it because they're all amazing leaders, mm -hmm. but it's really focused on trying to provide the tactical community with paradigms, right? So much of what they do, much like leading, so much of what you do is paradigm-based decision-making, right? You look mm -hmm. at something and you go, I always use the example of water, right? There's three forms of water, you know, solid, liquid, and gas. If you only know water as a liquid, you don't understand solid and gas, right? Once you've seen ice, then you know, oh, that's, that's frozen water. But if you don't, you have to draw inferences. And mm. so much in a tactical environment, the decision-making is inferential. This situation is like this other situation, except this, there's this difference. Same thing with doctors, right? They look at it and they're like, oh, this is like. So part of the goal of the podcast is to capture the stories of these guys so that other people can hear them and file them away. So when they find themselves in those situations, they have that paradigm. And yeah. what I realized early on is there is, there's no, we're in such a small industry that there's no formalized vehicle for a lot of that information to get out. So I, I recently interviewed one of the team leaders for the Bataclan hostage rescue in Paris and went through the whole story. Now, nobody in the very few people in the U.S. are ever going to act with, interact with these guys. They're never going to hear this story firsthand. So by creating a platform to share these stories. Now, every tactical officer, military person in the world, theoretically, can listen to that. And that's one more paradigm. So that's really the, the primary goal of the podcast is, is yeah, officer cool. safety. Yeah. Okay, good. And so what sort of made you decide to start that podcast? So I, I've spent almost my entire adult life invisible to the internet. I spent, you know, I say I was invisible for 35 years. I, I always kind of kept myself out of it. I didn't really write much outside of the tactical community. I didn't give public presentations. And a few years back, one of our friends died, got ALS and died. And there were several of us standing at his funeral and having a conversation about how much information we lost that day. This is a guy with 60 years of experience, both military and law enforcement. He's a fusion thinker. He, you know, he understands both doctrines and can put them together and teach. And he was an amazing guy. His name was Tim Anderson. When Tim died... The tactical community lost everything in Tim's head because we had never recorded him on video. He had never been recorded on audio. He hadn't written a book. And so all that information was gone. And, and I remember saying to a couple of the guys at the funeral, like, we need to do something about this. Somebody needs to capture these lessons learned. Somebody needs to interview these guys. Somebody needs to write this stuff down. And 
that one of them pointed out the problem for law enforcement in the military, and I, I know it's true in the U.S. and North America and Europe, and I'm sh- sure it's probably true in New Zealand. There is no upside for law enforcement or military to talk to the media. There's, they're not going to win because if they say 99 smart things and one stupid thing, the one stupid thing will lead the newscast that night and the 99 things will be on the floor. So they said, look, if you want to do that, you're going to have to do it because we're not going to talk to just anybody. We got to talk to somebody we know we can trust that is not going to twist the messaging and will actually put out the true stories. And after several months of conversations with people, I realized that I could trade my privacy for their legacy. Mm -hmm. And that was a good trade because the amount of, of knowledge to be gained by listening to these guys and, and hearing their stories and hearing their views on leadership and the way they solve problems and make decisions is so great that it was worth the trade. So that was yeah. when we started the podcast. It was just over a year ago. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leadership is Changing with your host, Dennis Giannoutsas. Each week, we and our guests provide information and insights through exploring leading change, inspiring executives and leaders to adapt and lead a bigger game in a fast-moving world.